Welcome to the podcast of Living Faith Fellowship in Klamath Falls, Oregon. Now, Pastor Rich preaches the message, Ain't No Rock, from Psalm 61. We pray that God will use this sermon to speak to you directly. And now, to Rich. So in the year 2000, we had bought five acres in Penn Valley, California, and we hired a contractor to help us build this house and specifically to pour the foundation on these five acres. The contractor had told us that he was qualified. He told us he was licensed and he had experience building homes. So we dug the footings. We added the necessary rebar and metal. We did all this stuff. And then he came in and he built the form boards to pour this foundation. Well, the morning of the pour came and the cement truck showed up. A pumper truck showed up as well as six guys I had hired to have extra help with this. So after pouring the concrete, many of you know, it takes several days to cure. And so we had to leave it alone for a few days and let it cure as I so patiently waited. (laughs) So after waiting, the contractor removes the form boards. And to his surprise and our surprise, the foundation was not level. In fact, over 80 feet, the foundation was off an inch and a half. Now, that may not sound like a big deal to those of you who don't know, but that's a big deal. And just imagine for a moment, had we just ignored that and went ahead and built on that lopsided foundation. All throughout scripture, we have pictures as a rock, as a firm foundation. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 7, 24. Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. But in contrast, everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. And great was that fall. Keep that in the back of your mind as you open your Bibles with me to Psalm 61 this morning as we continue to survey through the book of Psalms. Most people believe that David wrote this psalm while he was on the run from his son Absalom. Absalom had killed the heir apparent Amnon, After Amnon raped Tamar, and then Absalom wanted to be king in his father's place. So Absalom gathers this support, he gathers some followers, and he starts this rebellion, and David has to run away to save his life. Imagine the king who had united the northern and the southern parts of the kingdom. This guy, this king, he has to run because his son rebelled and is out to kill him. So David becomes emotionally torn. Do I preserve my son's life or do I take back my kingdom? There's the challenge. So if you have your Sunday sermon notes, Roman numeral one, here's the prayer of the broken. The prayer of the broken. If your Bibles are open, Psalm 61, look at verse one. He says, hear my cry, O God, attend to my prayer. Warren Wiersbe said, hear the urgency of the king here. Hear the urgency, how he's so overwhelmed and that he's crying out to God, doesn't know what to do with this situation. Many of us have been in this type of situation. Well, there's good news there in your notes. The Lord hears our prayers, even when they are spoken from our hearts, when we cannot express our feelings with words. The Lord delights in answering prayers of brokenness. The Lord actually delights in answering broken people's prayers. That's good news because everyone in here this morning is broken somehow. And if you don't think you're broken, you're broken worse than I am. (laughs) Paul said this in Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the spirit also helps in our weaknesses for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the spirit himself makes intercessions for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. 
Have you ever been so desperate that you're crying out to God and maybe you're just babbling? Maybe you're just groaning, you're moaning, you don't even know how to say or what to say with the words. Good news, the Holy Spirit knows your heart and he will pray to the Father on your behalf. That's good news. You know, the Lord hears all of his children, there's a caveat, his children's prayers, but he's especially full of compassion when his children are broken. God cannot resist a contrite and a broken heart. He loves us and he shows more compassion even during those times. Jesus spoke a parable about prayer that I want to share with you out of Luke 18. Jesus said, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this filthy tax collector next to me. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not even as much as look his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted." There in your notes, when we have exhausted all other options during a need or a crisis, we should learn to call out to the only one who loves us and can make a way when there is no way. There's only one who can do that. You may remember the story out of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the apostle Paul had a thorn in the flesh and we're not 100% sure what it was, but he cries out to God three times, God, take this thorn, God, take this from me, God, take this from me. And the rich O'Toole version is God told him, sit down and be quiet. <laughs> My grace is sufficient for you. Why? Because in your weakness shows my strength. God is attracted to our weakness. In fact, Jim Cimbala in his book, Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire, said this, I have discovered an astonishing truth that God is attracted to weakness. He can't resist when his children cry out to him in brokenness. You know, I don't know why the Lord has chosen prayer as the vehicle to, that he likes to work through, but he has. And it's for two reasons. One, he wants to hear from you. It's a personal relationship. But the other reason is he wants us to fully depend upon him. But the Lord has chosen prayer as his vehicle, and I don't know what it is. But here's the deal, and most of us don't realize this, that God will answer every prayer of his people. Fully rely upon God. There in your notes, the Lord's answers are given in his time for his reasons, according to his will and good pleasure. Sometimes the answer is yes, sometimes is no, and then my personal favorite, sometimes is wait. So what do we do? Roman numeral two, we need a rock that is higher. A rock that is higher, look at verse two. David said, from the end of the earth I will cry to you. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. What a prayer. I will cry out to you from the very ends of the earth. Lead me to the rock that's bigger than myself. Lead me to that rock. And, and notice, from the ends of the earth, you need to know something. David, again, is on the run. So he can't go to that tabernacle where the Shekinah glory of God is. But he didn't give up hope that no matter where I am in this world, God will hear and God will answer, and God loves me. He never gave up that hope. There in your notes, David never traveled much of the world during his life, but he was communicating that there's not a place in all of creation that the Lord cannot reach. In fact, the psalmist said this in Psalm 139, 8. If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there, catch this promise, even there, your hand shall lead me and your right hand, that's the hand of strength, shall hold me. 
Do you know that God's powerful hand holds you if you're his child this morning? Here's the deal. When we get to the very end of all human understanding and every resource we have, we finally get to a place where God says, aha, now I can move. We wonder why God won't move. And we tell God, how about you? Do you tell God this? You know, God, if you'll do this and this and this and this, that whole situation will work out, God. And God's sitting back going, gee, you know, I never thought of it that way. Thanks for your advice. What he wants is us to get to the very end of ourselves, the end of our resources, the end of me. And the end of me, by the way, dies hard. And so the end of me doesn't feel good. But God says, when you get to the end of yourself, then, then I can move. Notice David said, when my heart is overwhelmed, take me to the rock. Take me to the rock that's higher than I. You know, you got to remember, David's depressed, he's exhausted, he's running from his son who wants to kill him. And he's like, there's only one place I can go. Take me to the rock. There in your notes, because the rock symbolizes stability, a strong foundation, a firm footing, wisdom, and power beyond David's abilities. Back up in history a little bit, remember when the children of Israel were freed from Egypt? And they had just been freed. Moses does all these signs and wonders, right? God gave Moses all those plagues. And finally, Pharaoh lets him go. And then God performs that final miracle, split in the Red Sea, and, you know, killed all of Pharaoh's armies and chariots and all that. And what happens is they come upon a time where water's in short supply. And the children of Israel begin to complain, not only against Moses, but against God, too. Exodus 17, 3. And the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it that you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses, not knowing what to do with this rebellious children that God had given him, says, What shall I do with this people? They're ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel. Also take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river and go. Listen to the promise from God. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock of Horeb and you shall strike the rock and water will come out and the people will drink. Verse 17. So he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the contention of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, listen to this, saying, is the Lord among us or not? You think of all the miracles they have witnessed. You think of the Red Sea being parted and flowing over the armies. You think of how God has provided over and over again to these people. And yet the first challenge The very first challenge, is the Lord among us or not? Make that personal. God has made us so many promises. And we're going along in life and we don't stop to consider that he gives us our very next breath. We don't stop to consider that he has given us our hands with which we can make money. He's given us our food. He's given us everything. He's given us a church. He's given us everything. And then all of a sudden we have a little hiccup in the road. Little speed bump. Do we then say, God, are you with us? I'd love to tell you I've never done that. But I've done it. You would think that they'd begin to trust the Lord and just sit back and say, whatever it is, God's going to work this out. But no, instead, they tempted the Lord by asking the question, is the Lord with us or not? Now, if God wasn't a patient God, he would have just smote him right there, right? Right? Get out of the way, I'm going to smite them dead right here. Moses, I'll raise you up another people group. But notice what he promised. I'm going to stand before you in Horeb. I'm going to be there. Just do it. My presence is with you in the desert. And they again asked, is the Lord with us or not? Doubting the Lord and his promise was their great sin. That was their sin. It wasn't that they wanted water. It wasn't that they wanted food. They doubted the Lord. So fast forward just a little bit in their history. God provides water from the rock being smitten. 
And again, water's in short supply again. So what do they do? Well, God smote the rock last time. Let's trust him. No, they complain again. And this is what we're told in Numbers 20, verse 7. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together and catch what he says this time. Speak to the rock before their eyes and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animals. Notice what God said. Hit the rock the first time, but speak to the rock the second time. But Moses, in his anger and frustration with the people that God had given him, instead of speaking to the rock, hit it a second time. And you say, why is that such a big deal? Well, hold on and I'll tell you why. The first time when God told Moses to hit the rock, strike the rock, it would produce water for the people. And the second time he said, speak to it. When you fast forward into the New Testament, we're given a little light to tell us what the big problem was. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 10.1. By the way, before we get there, if someone ever tells you that Jesus isn't in the Old Testament, here's one of like hundreds of examples. Moreover, brethren, I don't want you to be unaware that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. We're all baptized into Moses and into the cloud and into the sea. All ate the same spiritual food there in your notes. All drank the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And catch this. And that rock was Christ. Verse five. But with most of them, God was not well pleased for their bodies were scattered in the desert. What Moses did was more than disobey God. What Moses did is he misrepresented not only the father, but he misrepresented the Christ, the Messiah. How? Well, here it is. The first time God told him, strike the rock. Jesus Christ, strike the rock. Jesus was going to die once for all, for all sin. The next time all you got to do is speak to the rock. Because the rock would provide for you. Jesus doesn't need to die again. We don't have communion and re-crucify Christ. We don't put Christ back up on the cross. Strike the rock once and then speak to the rock and it will provide water of life. God gave him this whole picture and yet Moses in his anger smote the rock a second time. Paul said this in Romans 6, 9. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died once to sin for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Jesus died once. And all we have to do is speak to the rock. All we have to do is put our faith in the rock. That's all we have to do. For the person who's received the free gift of salvation, all you have to do is confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you shall be saved, Romans 10, 9 tells us. And then once you've done that, Hebrews 4 tells us now, if you're a child of the living God, you can boldly, Come in before the throne room of grace and receive help in your time of need. You can boldly come into the holies of holies because of what Christ did on the cross. The Lord asked Moses, trust me and follow. And Moses misrepresented him. And notice what 1 Corinthians 10, 5 says again. But with most of them, God was not well pleased. What's that talking about? You got to understand that entire generation that came out of Egypt, with the exception of Caleb and Joshua, not even Moses could go into the promised land because they didn't trust the Lord. They were forbidden and they all died out there in the desert. Joshua and Caleb are the only two that came out of Egypt that was allowed to go into the promised land. Despite all the blessings, despite all the miracles, the Israelites would not trust the Lord and take him at his word. So what was the problem? Why was God so angry? It's very simple. Here it is. Hebrews eleven six. Without faith, that's trust. 
It's impossible to please God. For those who come to him must do two things. Believe that he is and believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. There in your notes. So faith is weighing the evidence of what God has said would happen and then believing him. Especially when we cannot see the evidence with our physical eyes. There it is. Faith isn't some giant force where we create reality. No, faith is taking God at his word even when we can't see it. God said it. That settles it. I believe it. And in light of all those blessings, you would have thought the people would have been grateful. But they didn't trust the Lord. And so here again, back to Psalm 61, David is depressed. He's tired. He's on the run. He's hungry. And basically, Psalm 61 shows us that Jesus is the rock. Jesus is the rock that gives us stability and the strong foundation and the firm footing and power beyond our own capabilities. So Roman numeral three, a shelter and a strong tower. Look at verse three with me. David said, for you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the shelter of your wings. There in your notes, ancient cities had walls all around them and usually had a tower as a lookout place. The assurance we have, along with the safety we enjoy from the Lord, is our shelter and our strong tower. Proverbs 18.10 said, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run in and they are safe. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Let, let's have that picture there. A few years ago, Sandra and I got to go to Germany. We got to visit a city. There's a few walled cities left in Germany, and this is Ladenburg. Ladenburg has the wall around the city, and it has a tower up top. So it was so cool to see this. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run in and they're safe. And we got to see this firsthand in Ludenburg. Michael Jake says this. A strong tower is an elevated tower that it's so high that you can't get to it. You can't be captured. It's inaccessible. And one of the uses for towers in the Old Testament was a fortress, catch this, during times of battle. When we battle, where do we run? Some of us run to the bottle. Some of us run to food. Some of us run to somebody else. But the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run in and they are safe. Judges 9.51 says, There was a strong tower in the city, and all the men and the women and all the people of the city fled there and shut themselves in, and then they went up to the top of the tower. There in your notes, David trusted in the Lord to be his strong tower, where he could flee and find strength and safety in his time of need. And then notice what David said. I will abide in your tabernacle forever. Now, when I hear tabernacle, I always think of the tent out there in the desert where the Shekinah glory of God lives, right? I always think of the holies of holies. And I think, yeah, that's probably what he meant. But again, remember, he's on the run. He can't go to the tabernacle. And so there's a dual meaning here. Yes, for some, it's speaking of that place where the Shekinah glory of God was. But it's also speaking of a tent. How do I know that? Again, David's on the run. And a tent during David's time represented a few different things. It was shelter. It was safety. A place of rest for the weary and, and hospitality for an honored guest. And so David said, I go into your tent and I am secure. And then notice he says, and I will trust in the shelter of your wings. And again, there's two ideas here. Because when we think of wings, maybe we think of a bird protecting her chicks, right? This is what Guzik said there in your notes. Wings as a near and protected place that a mother bird gives to her offspring, protecting her chicks under the shelter of her wings. But then the second idea is think again of the holies of holies. And, and there's the Ark of the Covenant. And there it is being guarded by the cherubim with the wings. 
And so this idea of a bird guarding and then the idea of God sheltering us, the wings, no other images in all of creation like a shelter, a strong tower, the tabernacle and the shelter of your wings gives a picture for how God loves us and how much God protects us and takes care of us. So David says all these things and then he gives the answer to prayer. Roman numeral four. Look at verse five with me. For you, O God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. You will prolong the king's life. His years as many generations. He shall abide before God forever. O oh, prepare mercy and truth, which may preserve him. So I will sing praise to your name forever that I may daily perform my vows. Listen to what David said. You, O God, have heard my vows. There in your notes, David made a vow to the Lord, which basically was saying he wanted to serve the Lord with his whole heart. He wanted to serve God. Is that your desire to serve the Lord with your whole heart? God doesn't want any half-hearted people. God wants your whole heart. Van Gimmeren said this, that long life literally means days, and it's an idiom for prosperity and a reigning monarch that he will preserve. Think of like the Queen of England and, and her lineage. But there's another dual meaning here. Like all through the Psalms, there's a lot of dual meanings. There's obviously David was talking about himself, that God, you will preserve your king. You will preserve my lineage. But verse six is actually speaking of Messiah. The king's life will have many generations. The Messiah will abide before God forever, forever. Adam Clark said this, he shall abide before God forever. Literally, he will sit before the Lord, eyeball to eyeball, forevermore. Now, David believed the Lord. The Lord had told David, Messiah is coming through your family. This is the adulterer, the murderer. This is the one who has failed over and over again. And God said, because you're a man after my own heart, Messiah is coming from your bloodline, which should just blow us away. But he believed the Lord when the Lord said, Messiah will come through you. Second Samuel seven sixteen, And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. There in your notes. David's physical kingdom would last longer than King Saul's kingdom for sure. But David also knew that Messiah was to come through his lineage and his kingdom would last forever. He believed when God said, Messiah's coming through your bloodline. I believe you. And then notice what he says. Oh, prepare mercy and truth, which may preserve him. The first part of that is David said, I need mercy and truth, no doubt about it. And which is so ironic because Messiah was going to give us mercy and truth. John said it this way, John 1, 17, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. You want the law? There's your choice. You want the law that came through Moses? Keep it perfectly. But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And I want you to notice David's response. He gets to this pinnacle of the prayer. He starts out crying out. Then he says how good God is. And he gets to verse eight. And again, he says, so I will sing to your name forever that I may daily perform my vows. C.H. Spurgeon said this. God daily performs his vows and keeps up his promises. So let us now keep up our part. David began crying out to the Lord. Depression, desperation, hunger, he's on the run. But he ends the psalm saying, I will praise the name of the Lord forever and ever. Because praise is the way that we show God our amazement at who he is and all that he's done. Praise also recognizes God's goodness. And so David said, no matter what happens, I'm gonna praise God for the rest of my life. There in your notes. 
So we should praise the Lord because he's worthy of all praise, glory and honor because who he is and his faithfulness. So now as we get practical this morning, I'm going to ask you a question. What are you going to do with this rock? What are you going to do with Jesus Christ? Because you've got to make a choice. I'm going to share another verse out of the New Testament with you that kind of determines the choice. Listen to what we're told in Matthew 21, 44. Whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Let me give you the definition there. When we're broken and we fall on the rock, Jesus Christ, we'll be saved. No matter how broken you are. And you might say, but you don't know my life. You don't know what I've been through. No, I I probably don't. But if you fall on Jesus Christ, you're going to be saved. But if you wait until that final judgment and he falls on you, it won't be a good day. He's going to grind you to powder. It's not going to be a good day. And again, remember, David is depressed and he's exhausted and he's broken. And so he cries out to the only one who can make a difference. He cries out to the rock, his firm foundation, his firm footing, his wisdom and his power. Again, fast forward to the New Testament. Think about Palm Sunday. What was going on as Jesus enters Jerusalem and his disciples are praising him and his disciples are saying, this is Messiah. This is God's savior. This is the one that's going to save us all. And in that narrative, this is what Luke 1937 says. As he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. Think about this scenario. Again, his ministry is about to come to an end. It's a week away from his crucifixion. He's coming into Jerusalem. The only one, by the way, on that specific day that was prophesied through Daniel chapter nine that would ride into Jerusalem on the full of a donkey and his disciples, the whole multitude at this time, he still has a bunch of followers. They haven't ran away from him yet. And they're all praising God, calling him Messiah. This is what they were saying. Verse 38. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory to God in the highest. Listen to what the religious leaders do. You got to love these guys. They see the fulfilled prophecy. They see Jesus coming in. They know he's the only one who could fulfill all 305 prophecies about him. And this is what they say. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd and said, teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he said to them, I tell you the truth, if these keep quiet, then the stones are going to cry out. I really wish in this narrative that they would have quieted down and watched the stones cry out. That would have been pretty awesome, right? (laughs) Maybe you remember the song, Ain't No Rock. But Ain't No Rock says it this way. Ain't no rock going to cry in my place. As long as I'm alive, I'm going to glorify his holy name. Ain't no rock going to cry out in my place. As long as I'm alive, I'm going to glorify his name, praise his name. As long as I'm alive, I'm going to glorify his name. Why should we glory in God? Let me give you a promise from the Apostle Paul in Colossians chapter 1. Verse 12 says this, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints and the light. Stop there for a second. The penalty for sin is death. Paul very clearly says we have all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. So what qualifies you to get into heaven? And Paul says it right here. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints. He goes on. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of his son in love. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Think about this. When you apply for a job, you got to show that you're qualified. I'm going to give you a little warning this morning. If you show up at the pearly gates 
And Jesus meets you there and says, what qualifies you to come into heaven? You'd better not list your ministries, your giving, your church attendance, your singing voice. You had better leave all that behind and say, the only thing that qualifies me to get into heaven is the blood of the lamb. He has qualified us for the inheritance. If you get up there and say, well, you don't understand. I went to Living Faith Fellowship for like 48 years. So what? You don't understand. I was on the worship team for like 25 years. So what? You don't understand. I gave so much money to the church. So what? He has qualified me. Your education, your works, your gifts, all your talents don't qualify you. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. It's not anything you have done. It's what he has done. So the Lord hears our prayers, especially when we're broken. It's because God wants to do it. And as long as we can figure it out and as long as we can write the check, as long as there's something we can do, we will never stop and glorify the Lord. And so when we get to the very end of ourselves, the end of our resources, the end of everything we have, then we're broken. And God said, that's the person I want to hear. Because a broken and contrite spirit, God loves. And, and again, Wiersbe said, listen to the urgency of King David's prayer here. Hear my cry, O Lord. Have you ever been that broken? Where all you can do is cry, hear my cry, O Lord. And God says, okay. The prayers of the broken, God delights in. So go to the rock, the firm foundation, who has the water of life. Go to the rock, the rock of your salvation. There's no other way. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes except by me. And if you think somehow you're qualified to get in, Jesus put it this way in Matthew 5, 48. You can either be perfect. Matthew 5, 48, you shall be perfect. And they would ask, how perfect? As perfect as my heavenly father. Well, he goes on, of course, in the book of Romans saying we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. No one is perfect. So that choice is gone. So then there's only one way. The perfect substitute, Jesus Christ, who willingly shed his blood on Calvary. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one. And you know that Greek word, it means no one. Comes to the Father but by me. So go to the rock. If you fall on that rock, you shall be saved. But if that rock falls on you, you're going to be ground into powder. And that's going to be an awful day. Go to the rock. He loves you. He willingly gave his life for you on Calvary. He loves us so much. Don't be like the Israelites who in their rebellion couldn't go into the promised land because they didn't trust what the Lord said. Instead, be like Joshua and Caleb who took the Lord at his word, trusted him, trusted what he could do, and he provided the way. Please don't go out of here thinking that you're self-sufficient because there's nothing you have that's sufficient to get you to heaven. You're either going to fall on that rock or that rock's going to fall on you. Thank you for listening to Rich's message, Ain't No Rock, from Psalm 61. Next week, we will continue in the book of Psalms. Join us every Sunday morning in person at 9 a.m. or 10.30 a.m. or online at 10.30 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time. Watch our live stream on our website, YouTube, or Facebook. Our website is livingfaithklamath.com. Find our social media by searching for Living Faith Fellowship Klamath. You can also find all of our links in the description of this week's episode. All sermons are available on our website. Find resources at the top and then click on sermons. If you want to show your appreciation, you can tell others about us, subscribe to our podcast, and you can also leave a review so more people can hear the word of God. Thank you again and God bless you.